One of the longtime sponsors of the show is Dogtra. Eric and I are actually both field staff guys. So uh, Dogtra has been committed for over 20 years to crafting training college to perfect precise fit and finish and intuitive design and, account- and accountable performance. The 1900 SE collar demonstrates what they strive for, which is an ultimate dog training tool that is durable, dependable, and designed for the most demanding conditions. And I actually use this thing at the kennel. They have the new black one that has the lock and the boost feature on it as well, as well as the hands-free, which we use a ton. If you guys follow me on social media, you see that I use that during tracking. and We do that negative reinforcement trick, which is what the fuck is the collar that we're using. The other thing is the YS600. So funny fact, it stands for yo, shut up the number of times <laughs> that you won't have to say it because it works every time. So use the discount code WDR10 for 10% off any single item over 200 bucks. And of course, they also have the popper and the dropper, which I think I have five of the kennel I use all the time. So hit them up, dogtra.com, WDR10 for 10% off a single item over 200 bucks. All right, we are back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite from uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. It hits 2023. We just released that next year it's going to be in uh, New Orleans. You see where they say that the Mardi Gras, Jambalaya, <laughs> a crawfish etouffee of the Big Easy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm super looking forward to that. Uh, word for the wise, though, if you're going to go down there and go to Bourbon Street, I'm pretty sure that the troopers hire every running back from like LSU and put them through the academy and they're like you get to work Bourbon Street because every single one of them dudes is about 6'4 and 300 pounds and they love to tackle people so uh, just uh, I know how you guys are yeah. don't go to Bourbon Street <laughs> Stay out. Yeah, I, I stay at sure. the hotel. Decent, yeah. I, I don't leave. Yeah, so. I go to Emeralds and get a little bam. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, with me as always, obviously I'm Ted Summers. Um, with me as always, Eric Stambro sitting across from me. Uh, I instruct this morning. You instruct tomorrow morning. So yeah, yeah, it'll be good. Your class is good. Um, all the classes, man. Everybody's in class. There's just a few people kind of wandering in around the vendors right now. That's a thing. Uh, there's guys that come to these things. They're just not coming to go to class. They just need a fucking break, man. So uh, I get it. But uh, Or they're picking and choosing, hopping in and out. I'm bouncing around from class to class. I always like to try to support guys in this industry that we know, and I always pick up a couple things, and hopefully maybe they'll pick up some stuff from me. But, yeah, uh, it's going going really well. The uh, Most classes got standing room only at the uh, guys hanging out the back of the of the rooms, they had to, I saw them wheeling in a big cart of like thirty extra chairs for Ritlands. Um, it's a good problem when you get four hundred and fifty people in a room and you got to roll in twenty five extra chairs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not bad, not bad. And considering there's four other, five other classes going on at the same time and everybody's busy, so it's good. What do we got going on? So this episode, uh, we have on a multiple time repeat guest, and we keep having him on because shit keeps changing. Uh, so it's good. With this from Hits Canine is Ted Douse again. Ted, how are you? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out to Scottsdale. Uh, yeah, it's been great. Uh, yeah, aside from it being hot, which I mean, it's there. God on. did invent air conditioning for a reason. It yeah. is. It's not bad in here. Yeah, all the California guys are like, it's freezing in here. I'm like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> you have no idea i've never been out here though uh i drove through one time i've never been out to this area it's nice i like the look of the southwest though i like that deserty mountainy kind of look in ohio it's just all green and gray gray sky green ground it gets, it's different yeah it's different they give you that uh it's don't worry it's 110 degrees but it's a dry heat. Mm-hmm. yeah it's, it feels like when i open the oven to check on the pizza rolls like it <laughs> it's not comfortable i don't give a shit I, <laughs> dude yeah. we got here yesterday we met some dudes out of the pool it that was brutal like you cannot walk you better have shoes on yeah. you know so i wore i wore uh clothes flops and i i had my feet in the pool with my shoes on i was like i'm not i'm not getting out of here so, uh, Ted, again, this is, I think, your f- fifth or sixth time on. Um, we always love to, to get you in here. You just taught your class on basically legal updates. There's a couple cases we want to just kind of yeah, fill and, everyone in. And every time we have you on, it's because people are freaking out about something. Very true. So let's yeah. talk about the freak out case <laughs> yeah, first. We, we went through medical marijuana, and we did that a couple of years ago. And now we're on that. So we've, we've done that. So let's talk about the freak out cases of 2023. Yeah, well, we have uh, the Supreme Court of Idaho. Idaho on the 
dog touching the vehicle the inter- is the now a, is now a trespasser. Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit about it real quick factually, but the bottom line that is the new Isaac Newton apple on my head. The sky's falling because you won't believe how many phone calls and emails I get um, over. You know, I'm a handler. You know, pick a random state in Nebraska and. Does that mean my dog can't touch the car? Yeah. And uh, I'm like, no. What it means is it can't touch the car in Idaho. Yeah. Um, because it is a centrally located case. It you know was decided. Um, I don't want to delve into too much law, but there's a case called uh, United States versus Jones, and it, it was the the tracker case. And before Jones, um, you could kind of get a basic court order. It didn't really rely too much on probable cause or reasonable suspicion or any of those buzzwords. It was kind of like a reasonable necessity. And you would go in and say, because bad guys were using countermeasures and counter surveillance and they were doing heat runs. And uh, so it made our surveillance more difficult or sometimes impractical. So judge, you know, here are some basic facts of our case. Can I get a tracker? And the judge would sign it. What we had generally across the country was a tracker order. And then you could go put the tracker on. Well, at some point in time, the Supreme Court of the United States reviewed all that and said, well, um, the car is a structure. And if you're going to enter the structure, like what, under the wheel well or in the bumper, or maybe somewhere in the engine compartment area, and you're going into that structure uh, to place the tracker, that you do need probable cause to do it so that any of the basic orders were invalidated and they said you basically got to get a tracker so you just write it and can here's the reasons that i need it and here's the facts that i have and can we put a tracker on the car and if it meets the probable cause standard then you sign it track so the what the idaho court took that and uh it was a there's three members or excuse me four uh, five members of the idaho supreme court it was a three to two decision with the chief judge uh writing a very articulate and poignant dissent, yeah, uh, saying that my although I respect my colleagues, they're cuckoo for cocoa puffs in the majority, yeah. and um, so it was a three to two opinion. But it is law in Idaho right now. I'm trying to figure out through my colleagues in Idaho, um, but I can't get much traction with the Idaho Attorney General's office to kind of find out where it is, like what they the rulings there, and it's now it's been there for. I don't know, maybe 60, 90 days or so or something like that. And, you know, things happen, what we call in my world, the pipeline. Where is it in the pipeline? Did Idaho wave the right flag and not appeal it and just accept it? So it's just law in Idaho. Have they tried to appeal it to the federal system and see if it where it can go and get traction? Maybe because they ruled Jones is a United States Supreme Court case. Yep. So if you're ruling that federal law dictates this is what we should do, you, then you can go to the federal court and say, you know, is Idaho right in the implementation of federal law and in, in, in search and seizure? Uh, I just not getting much help. I wrote like uh, you know two emails to two one of the lawyers that was involved and one to the attorney general's office, who's the super duper elected official. I just got no response. I made a couple phone calls, left a couple messages, got no response. So it's after, since I've retired, my computer access is a little limited, mm-hmm. um, and so it's not as easy to jump in and figure out where the case is and what's going on. So, um, but right now it's law in Idaho. I can't find out if it's had any traction in the federal system or did they wave the white flag and just accept defeat um, by the attorney general's office in Idaho. But for everybody listening, no matter what state you're in, uh, no matter what federal court you're in, even if you're in federal court in Idaho, um, it's an exclusively Idaho opinion right now that does in effect the operation of a dog in another state. Now, I just want to be clear. Um, you know, you could, you know, somebody in, in Nebraska could argue that the Idaho co- court got it right to judges in Nebraska and say, well, we want you to follow this logic. But what'd be great is I really think it's an oddball case. I really think it's a, a quirky yeah. ruling. And I think if you, your dog in Nebraska jumps up on the, its paws on the exterior of the vehicle to sift the door seam and happens to the safe single purpose passive, you know, go down, have a change of behavior, and then go down and sit. Let's just say that's the final response. Um, I think nine out of ten states are going to say 
uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, and, and if you read the decision, because I read all of the decisions, all of the concurring and all of the, the dissents, and the dissenting chief judge made a good point. He was like, you know, if the dog manages to turn running around the bumper and accidentally brushes his tail against the car, are we counting out his trespass also? And, I mean, he made some very good points, but if you read the the the, the general opinion, they go through, I want to say, about six pages talking about Lord Blackstone from the 1700s and about how they define what trespass is and what intermeddling. And I was reading it, and I was like, God damn, you guys took a long route to get here. <laughs> like, so, Who the uh, fuck is Lord Blackstone? It's a fucking British thing. It, if, it, you, <laughs> if, you're, if you're citing Black's Law Dictionary on from the 1790s, you know you're in trouble. But uh, And I had to see for myself. So um, Oklahoma is one of the states that has a mandatory state certification. And several, in fact, we've got uh, a couple of our state certifiers here. Um, and I had to see what this was. So I got a hold of the, I did a FOIA and got all the body cam from it to see what this actual trespass was. And if you're listening to this, you know exactly what it looks like. <laughs> like the dogs kind of put his paws on the car, like every other dog does. And that is tantamount to what they call intermeddling, which just, made my head spin watching it because in my head i was kind of thinking okay there's something weird here because you know they've made it really clear they do not want dogs in cars like that's pretty straightforward and you go back to like new york versus class where they talk about that officer reaching in and moving a piece of paper out of the way so you can read a vin number supreme court said that that was a search so i mean it's pretty obvious that they don't want you breaking the plane of the vehicle but they have no problem with officers touching the outside of the vehicle and it had to do with the dog being an instrument of law enforcement. And well, I think that the danger of the opinion that sometimes, you know, judges are pretty intellectual and, you know, they more are academics than practical trial lawyers for the most part. And I think what they've forgotten, what little bit I know, about, you know, I'm not a police officer and never been to the academy and never made an arrest. But, you know, I think about things like the troopers that are out there that you see on the old dash cams and they walk up and they touch a fender to get their fingerprints on there because, God forbid, they get shot or run over or attacked or something. And then those those folks drive away and they use, you know, hopefully fingerprints to identify this is the vehicle that was involved. But, you know, God forbid the Idaho Supreme Court says now if an Idaho trooper walks up to create some evidence to possibly catch a bad guy that could actually kill him in the next 72 seconds, um, that they would say, well, uh, those fingerprints were a trespass because they were intermingled with a car just like the dog. And I really think that they didn't really think it out because that's the next step for like a law enforcement officer that unfortunately gets killed at a stop for then somebody to say he touched it on film, look, Here's a dog touching something on film. I'm going to go with Judge Blackstone from 1882. It says that that's a trespass. So Judge suppressed the fingerprints that help identify the bad guy that shot the officer. I just don't think they think these things out when they make these, and I'm not saying shoot by the hip. I mean, obviously they did a lot of research if they're going back to knuckleheaded cases that are over 200 years old. But um, I think if you have to stretch your argument with that much law to convince people that you did it right, then you're just wrong because it should be a blatantly obvious thing. You shouldn't have to find uh, Chief Justice John Jay's first ever opinion to support <laughs> yeah. your search I and mean, seizure in 2023. Even me, like reading through that, I was shocked that the state Supreme Court even granted cert on it and why they didn't just kick it back and be like, yeah, the feds have already decided this. It's, <laughs> it's done. Like, we don't even need to hear it. Well, but, I mean... Well, the good thing is, and let me just tell all our listeners... Um, don't change what you're doing because of it, because this is how the law is going to work. The only way to defeat that case, if, if Idaho has waved the white flag and let's just accepted the result, I need a Nebraska handler. I need a Texas handler. I need a Florida handler. I need an Indiana handler, wherever you are to keep doing what you're doing. And I'm not saying you make your dog do it, but if your dog instinctively touches the car and you can see it on body camera vehicle, so be it. Let that defense attorney walk in with the Idaho case. Let your prosecutor argue against it. You win, you win, you lose, you lose, you appeal. But eventually when you get like, let's just pick a random state, the Indiana Supreme Court hears it. And they say, no, uh, uh, the Idaho Supreme Court got it wrong. 
And it, Jones doesn't really mean that. And we disagree with the Idaho Supreme Court. And they rule for the handler or the dog you know, who's merely touching it. And then you create conflict. And in the law, conflict is good. If the first case is against you, you then the, it almost forces the United States Supreme Court to answer the question because they can't have... 10 Idahos and 10 Indianas all saying that Jones tells us, our opinion tells us that we're right. And they eventually will then say, we have to hear it and settle it. And if it's not coming up in the next, oh, two, three, four, five years, we, the court, Supreme Court leans conservative right now. And I guarantee you that they would reverse the dog merely touching it with its nose or having a paw on a bumper or something and being a trespass is mildly ridiculous. Isn't there a case that deals with the dog instinctively jumping into the window? Oh, and no, yeah, okay. there's, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's... I know one is Hutchinson. It's, a, it's a, probably a little bit old. I think it's from either early 90s or late 80s, but Hutchinson was, I believe, a dog jumping in, instinctively jumping into the hatchback of a vehicle that had to, but had a couple changes of behavior on the outside. So... Yeah, I mean, I guess what I guess the distinction would there is be that would be the dog having a full behavior change, but just not giving final indication. And in here, this is the dog, I guess, in the process of odor locating. So there might be a minor distinction there. But I think you're on the right track. I mean, and there was another one too, as a border patrol case where they, uh, it was a truck, like a, a pickup truck that had a uh, toolbox mounted to the back. And the dog instinctively jumped into the bed of the truck, which they didn't constitute as a search. But the handler breaking the threshold of the truck bed and pointing at the toolbox to direct the dog was. No. Oh, wow. Okay. So when I, if for people listening to this and you hear me say it, like I tell handlers not to fucking touch stuff. This is one and the inevitable outcome of why, yeah, like we're telling dick hand, to yourself. Yeah, get your fucking hands off the car. Uh, so speaking of people losing their mind, what is going on in Florida? <laughs> every, by the way, every episode is some shit in Florida. <laughs> like what's the, what's the latest one that I might the, know? The oh, no, one no. in the Supreme court. It just it was it was argued in the Florida. Supreme oh Court? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Passages. so yeah, this is a ordering people out of cars, and it was probably realistically inartful testimony by unintentional by the handlers. This is the basic nuts and bolts is: is uh, defendant gets pulled over. Um, he well, a, the, a traffic infraction is witnessed by an undercover detective in an unmarked car, and he doesn't have lights and sirens, and it's not marked. So then he witnesses a traffic infraction he I guess wants to enforce. He doesn't even have a ticket book, and he so he calls for a road patrol officer in a marked unit to come out. Happens to be a sergeant. The sergeant uh, comes out. They do the traffic stop. They approach the vehicle. Um, they get some the driver's license registration documentation and they go back to like the police car area and uh, he had asked for, he being whichever I, I'm assuming it's the sergeant that was in uniform asked for consent and I, I'm not real sure what if there were any other real factors but the defendant denied consent to search the vehicle for by the officer physically and so and he goes back and says you know screw it I'm gonna call for a dog and the dog arrives within five minutes but during that five minutes um, the undercover detective and the sergeant in uniform um, allowed the person to stay in the vehicle. And in theory, I, I just want the listeners to, you don't have to obviously agree with the argument, but just comprehend the argument. The theory is that you can order occupants of a vehicle out at a traffic stop for just officer safety, but you don't have to have a factor. It can just be routinely done. It doesn't mean that you can touch them, but you can order them out. And... So the argument was when the dog handler arrives five minutes later, the inartful testimony from either the road patrol, the sergeant, or the, the handler, and the handler did try to clarify it in his testimony. They said that they, they ordered the, the uh, occupants out of the car when the dog arrived to facilitate the dog sniff. So you got Pennsylvania versus Mims. I can order the driver out routinely. Um, Maryland versus Wilson that you can order all occupants of the vehicle about six years later. And then, um, but it all says for officer safety purposes. So the defense attorney made hay out of shit by saying um, you can infer that there was no officer safety concern by the first two officers that were on scene by five minutes for the first five minutes because they did nothing 
related to ordering them out. They must have seen nothing and, and, and nothing seen, nothing heard, nothing going on. And it's clearly if there was an officer safety concern, they would have taken some action to order them out of the car if they thought that that existed. So when the handler arrives, he says, you got to order them out of the car for um, so I can run the dog. But and he does try to clarify these. He catches on in the you know the court transcript that you know no I'm not ordering him out to run the dog. It's for my safety. And he goes on to articulate like if I'm walking around to the front of the car and I leave a, a somebody behind the wheel, they could start the car, run over me, kill me. They could injure the dog. Um, you know there could be a firearm because we haven't dealt with that yet. You nobody saw anything, but it doesn't mean that it's not hidden between the seats or underneath. And as I'm coming by the window of the driver's side door, he or she could grab it and shoot me um, because they're left in the vehicle. So for my safety, because things have changed um, when I get on scene, I have a different function than the road patrol officer. I have a different function than the person that did the traffic stop. I'm walking around a vehicle with attention to my dog and maybe even sometimes having my back to the occupants as I'm paying attention to the dog. So that creates the officer safety concern for me and it's different and it, but it only can be created when I'm there to do my job which is five minutes later um, so the court didn't buy it said well you know you can't order them out just to run the dog and we can infer there was no officer safety concern for the first two guys on scene didn't do anything for five minutes and that was the second district court of appeal they're kind of our liberal district court of appeal of the six ones we have uh, there were other cases that in, the, in our state that indicated the opposite style of ruling. So the Supreme Court took it. They had argument in May the 2nd, I think it was, of this year. And um, I uh, showed that video in my class. thought it was a nice perspective to see the Attorney General's office argue their position of why the 2nd District Court of Appeal got it wrong. And the lawyer for the defendant on the appellate level uh, got up and argued her position uh, she had a little bit of a rough time. So if you're going to go on YouTube or the Supreme Court of Florida, uh, the case is called Kreller with a C, and it was argued on May the 2nd. You can pull it up, and you'll, you'll get a good chuckle because she really got rope-a-doped by three or four of the, of the seven judges on the court. And um, I, I feel fairly confident in saying just by watching that argument that they're going to reverse the second the district and say that uh, – you don't waive it by whatever the first officer makes a determination on scene, like in the first minute, if you don't order them out, that there's no longer an officer safety concern, or you can't order them out in the middle of the traffic stop if something has changed and makes you do it. Uh, I think it's basically going to say if, if an, any officer on scene at any particular time determines that, oh, now I have an officer safety concern, I didn't realize it maybe in the first two minutes, but I, re I, re I, re I realize it in the third or fourth minute. Uh, you don't waive that and say, well, I just got to deal with it now. Uh, when it happens, order them out. And then since that officer has a different task than the first two, his task then does put him in a precarious situation to where it would be better for him to order the people out of the vehicle. And I think they're going to say that Mims and Wilson allow that. And I would think that the officer, the canine handler, is in charge of his own understanding of whether he's safe or not. You know, like I, I'm getting him out because I'm un, I feel unsafe here. Not doesn't matter what the first two guys I would think, but then well, again, I, I mean, I might it might catch traction if the first two guys had the exact same role. Uh, yeah. yeah, but the when your third officer shows up and he's going to take a totally different role than mm -hmm. the first two officers, right. his role may place him in jeopardy. Yeah. So therefore it's his determination because he's going to do something different on scene to make that determination on whether he needs them out for his, his or her safety. And I think that's a fair determination because, you know, I don't know if crime scene shows up, they have a whole different role to play. And if they needed people out of the vehicle to do the crime scene thing, well, I'm not, a, I'm a road patrol guy, yeah. you know? So, I mean, I think it can just be at any point in time, if your function as a police officer determines it's going to put you in a different scenario, that different scenario then could lead to 
an officer safety concern that's a necessity. I mean, it may not rise, arrive at the, till the 10 minute mark of your traffic stop, but if it's there, it's there at the 10 minute mark and you can ask upon it. And a lot of states and the feds have a, a pretty good track record of defaulting. Like even after the post Rodriguez stuff, they make exceptions for, because the U.S. versus Campbell case, they had that, uh, it was a 26 second extension based on questioning. And they just said that that 26 seconds was an unnecessary prolonging of the stop because it didn't revolve around anything related to officer safety and which i don't necessarily think is what they meant when they decided that but that's kind of beside the point but they have a pretty clear track record of allowing um like defaulting to the side of officer safety and i don't foresee them putting them in a position where that wouldn't be the case down in florida either so when the when the is the second circuit down there for them second dca second in florida D supreme court did they uh when they ruled against what was everybody panicking before it went to the supreme court when was the case originally? Wow. Um, yeah, they they were panicking. I, 20, 22 ish. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Initially, because they're all saying like, "Well, we order people out of a traffic stop. We could no longer do that now." And I'm saying that's totally not. So my advice to them was, if you're really, really super worried about it, then get with your road patrol officers, and if they're going to call out a dog. Um, note that things are changing, so then order them out of the vehicle so they're out of the vehicle um, prior to when the dog there. arrival. So therefore, there is no um, issue related to the court of saying when the, they arrived, they were ordered out for the dog search, the dog sniff, that they were ordered out within the first couple minutes related to officer safety of any officer that would arrive on scene and the ones that are already there. So if the dog, if the people are already out of the car when the dog gets there, it can't be def argued be a very difficult. Right, we say it was done to facilitate the dog search. Uh, the other side of this, uh, a lot of my local guys and all of our handlers, um, I teach our handlers get people out of cars. You do not search car people with car. Do not search cars with people in them. And if somebody calls you to come, make sure that they're out of the car by the time you get there. We have a case in Oklahoma uh, that never went to um, any. It settled, uh, but they searched a vehicle. Uh, with people in it and it was a dual purpose dog and uh the driver kind of leaned out and did some mouth noises at the dog and the dog comes up and takes a chunk out of this person's face and dog program it was a tribal nation dog program is uh, no longer and there was a fairly large fairly large settlement um as well so i uh yeah i don't <laughs> get, I tell handlers, I'm like, and they, I've had people say, we're like, well, they don't want to get out of the car. I'm like, that, I don't, nobody cares what they want. <laughs> like, get them out of the car. I mean, it's a lawful stop. It's a reasonable request to like get them out of the car. And it could be deemed in a lot of jurisdictions. Um, it's a lawful order. And, and if the handler decides it's a safety factor for him and for the occupants, just like you say, if it had been ordered and they stood 20 feet away from, away from the car as a backup officer, there'd be no squeaky noises for the dog and the dog's not biting your cheek off. So there's a, it's a double edged sword. It protects occupants and it protects the handler. And I th thoroughly believe, and there's some Florida law and, and sheriff's office opinions on it, legal advisor opinions that say that if you're asked to exit a vehicle um, and you don't, and it, that is preventing the officer to further his job or her job and duties, then that's an obstruction charge. And that's a misdemeanor committed in your presence and that they're arrestable at that point in time. Oh, yeah. Eric had one of those with, uh, with that dog, Vlad. Yeah, yeah. We had one of those constitutionalist dudes. That's that's what gets them every time is refusal to get out. Um, so one one case I want you to just not case uh, well I guess case to talk about you've probably talked about it a million times. Uh, we've talked about it and everything. It's still the number one question asked in all forums is the case about searching passengers if the dog hits on the car. Oh, it's God. the number one. I see it nonstop. Who am I going to hit? You or Ted? Uh, like hit hit you hit Ted. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's the most. In, I'm going to mispronounce the name of it. My God, about five times a year I get that U.S. versus Acachando and Chando. Yeah, yeah, yeah BS stuff. Um, it's like the only opinion out there from 25 years ago that says that you know you can infer that, but it, the. If you're out there and you've got Ancachando in your back pocket or something, is um, that people are containers and vehicles? I should just tell you, you know, be careful what you read and how it's interpreted. And I don't mean this in any egotistical way when it's done by a civilian. 
Um, a couple of things you need to know about that case, and you should th immediately throw it away and never, ever pronounce that name again. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not around me. It makes me want to pull whatever hair I got left out out. Um, it's a Border Patrol case. It, the case gets triggered because there's one of those sensors out in the desert. So the first contact of the case is it's a Border Patrol trigger crossing the border alarm where they happen to send a Border Patrol officer out who's a canine officer to discover who may have illegally entered into the country. So right off the bat, we all know a border search or um, what they call it, a nexus to the border search if you're like 10 miles into the country or something like that. You don't have any Fourth Amendment rights if you're illegally sneaking into the country. You can be searched at the border. So right off the bat, the premise that the non-lawyers miss because they just read one paragraph on page eight or something is that it's a border patrol search case. Then he finally locates the vehicle and probable cause is probable cause when the dog does alert and they are in the vehicle. And so what the court sometimes, and you learn this when you go to law school, is sometimes the court will pull out old ancient you know, books like, what was that, Lord Macduff of the yeah, 1770, Blackstone, Blackstone, Lord Blackstone or whatever. Or whatever they and, um, yeah. But there's an, a theory to save a case where you can say, okay, the search was illegal, but he would have been arrested anyway. And then we can say, we'll pretend of create a legal fiction that he was arrested, and then we found it search instant to arrest. So here, because there was probable cause to search the vehicle and they were in there, the court then chose the option to say, you can't, they don't come right out and say you can't search the people, but they do say, like, because it was improper, but they were arrestable because there was a probable cause determination. So, just so you get where I'm coming, the legal fiction, they were kind of sticking it to these people to basically either put them in prison for whatever drugs they found or whatever, because what they ended up, the fiction they created was because there was a probable cause, and that's what you need to make an arrest, we're going to say that they were arrestable when the dog alerted. There's nobody out there in the United States that's getting a dog alert and then cuffing the person, throwing them in the back, and taking them to the sally port and arresting somebody on a exterior car alert. So they invented that, and they said they would have been arrestable because of basically the board, also the border crossing would have made them arrestable and trigger. So because if we go back in time, he could have just arrested them for the nexus to the border potential crossing and, and that they were the likely suspects. There were no other cars or anything in the area. Um, they could have been arrested for that. And then they would have found the drugs that were on them. Um, so they completely ignore the, I don't really ignore it, but they, they basically put the cart before the horse, so they reorganized the facts and said, let's pretend they were arrested for the border, they would have found the drugs on them, and it makes the dog irrelevant whether it was legal or not legal. And um, so it's really a funky case, and they end up, you know, the, the thing of it is is that people then read that case and they think, well, people are containers and cars. Uh, like people are like briefcases or people are like luggage or something, and they're not. And just everybody out there listening, and we've probably done this at least once a time before, there are three rights of privacy. Your car, lowest right of privacy. So if you're on the track running the hurdles, it's the smallest hurdle. It's easy to get over. That's why when the dog hits on a car, that you can search it immediately on the side of the road. In a general sense, there are some states that require a little bit extra. Uh, but the most majority of states allow that. Two, the right of your person. And three, king of your castle, queen of your home, your right of your home. So those hurdles go low, medium, and high. And so you always got to remember there's two rights of privacy going on at a traffic stop. Your personal right of privacy in your body and your right of privacy in your car, which is lowest. When you separate those two and you get them out of the vehicle, you keep your right of privacy in your person and the hurdle to touch you goes up. Yeah. And so, you know... A lot of times when you just read paragraph 7 of page 11, you know, 11 page opinion, you kind of lose track that, you know, your briefcase doesn't have its own 
high right of privacy is your person or uh, your or your grocery bag or whatever it is. That's the so I call it the Jay Z doctrine where people take legal advice like I know my trunk is locked, so is the so is the glove box, and I know you're going to need a warrant for that. And I'm like, no, we don't take legal advice from Jay Z. When people ask me about that case, I always give them. I can't remember the one. Off do the you top punch of my, them? No, well, oh, I send do. them the Maryland versus Pringle one, the Common Enterprise thing. Oh yeah. And then uh, there's a case from Wyoming where a trooper. Uh, stopped a car full of four people and he and the driver leans forward and he saw a syringe in the guy's pocket and he's like are you are you are you a diabetic and he's like no he's like okay get out of the car and he ended up finding a bunch of drugs in one of the passengers purses in the back and they arrested everyone in the car and so i can't remember the name off the top of my head but it's a from wyoming state police uh case but yeah those two every time somebody brings up anchondo i'm like in the case is like it's a pre Cabalis, yeah. pre Gantt that changed search and in incident arrest. I mean, it was like a 1991 opinion, and it was from the southern eastern district of Arizona. I mean, it's not even like the circuit or whatever. And um, I'm like, any in in my world, if you shepherdize it, that's the key word in le in legal terms, and le that's basically if you chase the history of it. Um, on the computer and you say, okay, how many people agree with Anna Chondo? How many people, how many courts in any state or any federal? And, you know, you find like one weird case in Kansas that says, well, this is a little shaky, but we're going to go with it. And then you find the 970 other cases that say they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. That's not the law. And they really come out hard and they say, not only is it not the law, we refuse to follow anything along that line because it's so out there. And that goes with even the own federal circuit in Arizona ignores that case as an outlier, far-fetched, you know, hard to say, but probably wrongfully decided if you make them say it, because nobody, almost nobody in, in the world, United States law, state and federal, says that's the cornerstone of search and seizure for dogs on people. They actually come out and say the vast majority come out and say it was wrongfully decided or it's so weird of a case that we're not even going to follow it or we're not even going to attain that argument and they just go on with their own analysis. Is there anything uh, else you got your eye on? Oh. Are you keeping your eye on stuff just because of this? And are you... You're retired, dude. Ish. I'm re retired from the formal practice of law as a prosecutor after 30 years in the Florida system. Uh, I do work for Fort Lauderdale Police Department in a different capacity, uh, civilian capacity in backgrounds and recruiting. Um, but you travel around, right? And do no, I still do lectures. I yeah, got, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got so one got it, in yeah. Georgia coming up, and I'll be in Minot, North Dakota for... Canine search and seizure. Now you did one in Ohio, like what we did an we Ohio dinner, yeah. one not too long ago. So I still do, uh, um, oh, probably realistically five or six a year, um, and go out and do either. Can we call it canines in the courtroom where we do certain narcotic search and seizure and uh, record keeping and stuff on the back end? It's an eight hour day thing. I do that with Andy Wyman, um, or sometimes they just want a good four hour search and seizure scenario. And, um, and I can do a lot more cause I can then give you a fact pack. I can spend 20 minutes on a case instead of five minutes on a case. Cause I got to get two hours worth of material in, yeah. in, yeah. in like, a, like here it hits. So I can kind of dip my toe in the pond here it hits. But if you really want the six hour version, it's really interesting cause we get down and dirty into the facts and circumstances and hypotheticals and a lot of departments like that. You get like a, 30 person class and you you fly somewhere and you do that for six hours it makes it for like one nice day of training classroom training yeah it's nice if uh, the prosecutors are there yeah <laughs> come yeah. on man <laughs> you gotta go because they don't know you, you, you know? can count on one hand the number of time a prosecutor showing up to my lecture which is baffling yeah so nothing on the horizon that you're outside of what we talked about that no, you know those are the two on? high ticket items because you know the florida supreme court's going to rule probably in the next 90 days or so yeah so that'll be interesting and then um no i don't know of anything there's no real supreme, united states supreme court canine cases pending that doesn't mean one can't pop up three months from now then that the court will hear because i'm sure there's requests coming in every month but the supreme court of the united states only hears 1.8 percent of what they're requested yeah here. So it's very so you think if you use easy math for every hundred requests please hear my case they hear two yeah. and uh, that includes 
social issues and abortion and voting and I don't want to get into too much possible, but whatever they're asked to do along with death penalty and, and, um, you know, uh, any kind of thing, you know, every a hundred, they hear two. So for every time you hear about a big case on, they decided on the news, you know, think that there were 98 other cases that were submitted with that that got, uh, no, thanks. We're not hearing that. Yeah. So if you get there, it's 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 a lot like the old hair hell mary in in uh football it's you chuck it up and you caught it and they don't happen very often but yeah. that's when you get actual oral arguments and opinions yeah and you get to do two of them right I got to yeah. participate in two of them so that was a clear bucket list i guess <laughs> the only other bucket list which i don't wish for although i think i would have before i got there is to actual argue it before the court is and stand up at the dais and make an argument but i tell people i was happy to do it but uh, wrote two amicus briefs and two merit briefs on florida versus harris and florida versus jardines and um that was kind of a bucket list as a lawyer to do that um but uh that's cool you know uh, watch out what you wish for because it's a it is a there is a there is a pucker factor when you stand yeah. up before uh, the Florida Supreme Court and you say, "Mr. Chief Justice, fellow justices, uh, you know, you got to be, you know, it's, it's got to be an interesting. It's, it's got to be a very limited family that ever appears before the court." So, so we're uh, you got another day training, teaching? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I did one this morning, and I'll repeat that class on Friday morning. And so tomorrow's class is all day. Um, and then uh, we have a little raffle and cocktail hour. A little raffle. Yeah, a little, There's not I was like, little, little raffle. I was <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's good. We like to give back. So um, yeah. we got like Satina $4,000 car insert and a Havis $4,000 car insert. And Ooh. I think uh, um, Owens, the crate company, I think it's like an $800 collapsible crate and um there's a lot of nice things we give about seven or eight kind of really nice prizes and then throughout the day um they're not that they're not nice but a lot of them gives gift certificates to their business and here's a hundred dollar gift certificate we so we raffle off a f fair amount of stuff as the conference goes on and the, the big ticket items are at the end when you can come get a free beverage at one of our eight bars that are yeah. located in the lounge to service our 1,200 plus handlers that are here at the conference. It was stacked at the vendor last night, vendor approval or and vendor appreciation. I'm just going to say it, that ain't a cheating thing. So if you're sitting there going, say, that's BS, you know, they don't have 1,200 handlers. Bullshit. I am telling you, I don't care where you go or what you do, there's a lot of fine seminars out there. But they ain't hitting twelve hundred plus. The no. line, the line at the taco truck and the line at the bar says that that number is is valid. Pretty accurate. When it's one hundred and seventy five fucking degrees outside and people mm. are still standing out there for tacos. So, <laughs> well, Ted, I'm sure we'll have you on again at some other point next um, year when we're in New Orleans. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the twenty sixth through the 29th, uh, into August next year. New Orleans hits twenty twenty four. Hyatt Regency, uh, downtown New Orleans. I know Ted uh, says avoid Bourbon Street, so we're a good five blocks away from Bourbon Street. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, going to the I'm going to the Ninth Ward during the daylight yeah, for the oh, chicken okay. fried chicken. Last time we were there, I yeah. just stepped over human poop. So true story. Uh, that was yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just just on in Bourbon I'm, Street. I'm glad you stepped over. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I was paying attention. So, anyways, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate hey guys, it again. thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out. All right, thanks. It's no secret that I love my ALM suit from Arnaud out at ALM Canine Equipment in sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. I've had that thing forever. Eric affectionately refers to it as my Carhartt suit because it's so thin. <laughs> uh, I've had multiple sleeves put back on it, send it back to Arnaud. He fixes me up every single time. The fit and finish is top notch. And it fits me like a glove. I refuse to go anywhere without it. I work sport dogs and PSA without it. I just did a trial in California wore that thing. I work police dogs pretty much every day of the week. And then I will use it for personal protection dogs as well. So hit ALM canine equipment up on Instagram and Facebook. And then go to ALM canine, letter K number nine, equipment.com. And use the discount code WD radio for 10% off of your first order. And this is completely custom. So made to measure, pick your colors, whatever you want to do. Arno will work with you. You can make it as thin or as thick as you want, but hit them up. AOM canine equipment. Ever dreamed of having your own kennel, but don't know where to start? Horizon Structures has taken all of the guesswork out of building a kennel. Everything is pre built to your specifications and preferences, and then assembled and dropped off on your land. Boom, new kennel. 
hooked up to your electric, hooked up to your water, put dogs in it that day. And those things are amazing. You've got to see them to truly believe them. Get on the website, horizonstructures.com. You can custom build. You can buy one that's already built. Go off of their design. Come up with your own design. They'll work with you. Uh, they always are running discounts on the website with ready-to-go kennels. The kennels are already ready to go. There's always discounts. Horizonstructures.com. Check them out. 